the Bible passages that I um, have been asked to preach on um, this year have been about adultery, judging others, and now confession of sin. And I realize I run the risk of being known as a prophet of doom at this rate. And for that, I am sorry. Let's hope that when you next hear me speak, it will be about joy or something a little happier. So let's make a start. My parents-in-law uh, used to walk past the house every day into town. And um, they passed the house with a really beautiful view. And uh, my mother in always wanted to live there, so she popped a little note through their letterbox once a year to say if they ever sold the house, would they please let her know um, because they were interested in buying it. And 20 years went by and eventually they got a phone call saying, yes, we're selling the house, uh, you can have first dibs. Um, they bought the house practically on the spot, but when they went round to see it, it wasn't really what they wanted, so they knocked it down and they built another one in its place. Um, it took over two years to build this house. Every tiny detail had to be decided, from the door fittings to the carpets to the paint colour. And eventually the day came when it was finally finished and there was great celebration. They decided to enjoy that celebration with their friends, so they invited some people around. And one lady um, parked in their drive and then realised she was taking up too much space. So she put her foot on what she thought was the brake it was the accelerator. Not only that, it was an automatic car, it was in reverse, and it shot backwards into the house, basically destroying it. <laughs> My poor uh, in-laws went rushing around the house to find out where on earth this, it sounded like a bomb had gone off, apparently, the noise was so great. So they rushed around the house looking for what on earth had happened. And uh, when they walked into what had been the study, they found a rather startled woman still sitting in her car in a state of utter shock. What had been a state of excitement and anticipation to do the finishing of their house turned into upset and disappointment. Uh, thankfully, just to let you know, the woman was absolutely fine. But how do you begin to apologize for something like that? Box of chocolates, sorry, just destroyed your house. It took a long time to put right. In fact, there were builders around the corner and they had to put up two steel pylons just to keep the rest of the house from collapsing. So. But I imagine that Ezra felt a kind of a similar emotion. He just spent four months traveling to Babylon at a huge personal cost. They arrive in Jerusalem full of excitement and had a huge party sacrificing um, burnt offerings to God. And at this point, their level of expectation must have been really high. The people were looking for revival, social and spiritual revival. Ezra was looking forward to a time of renewal when people would be thrilled to be back in the temple, worshiping God where God's presence was. He's expecting, no doubt, um, the, the, uh, people to be hungry for God's word. He had hope for a future Messiah from the line of David and hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and hope that God would bring his blessing just like he promised Abraham. He was wanting revival and then someone popped his bloom. He went from excitement and anticipation to devastation, a bit like Gareth's parents. So the Jewish leaders came to him and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples. They have taken some of their daughters as wives and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And you'll notice at the end of verse 2, it says that the priests and the officials have been foremost in this. In other words, the leaders who really should have known better. And then in verse 3, we read about Ezra's great confession to, sorry, reaction to this sin. And he prays a prayer of confession. His prayer, which ranks with Nehemiah 9 and Daniel 9, is one of the great prayers of confession in the Bible. And it shows us what the godly reaction to sin should be. I wonder how you feel and react when you hear news of another fallen Christian leader or your neighbor who's committing adultery. What's your reaction to sin? 
I think Ezra's reaction seems to us a little bit extreme. Why was he quite so upset? After all, the Jews are simply marrying people from another race. What's behind it all? So this morning, we're just going to look at the way Ezra, Ezra reacts to this news. And conveniently, they all begin with the letter S. Firstly, scripture. Ezra loves the law of Moses. It tells us in chapter 7, verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra was appalled when he heard about these Jews marrying pagans because basically he knew God's word condemns it. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7, um, 1 to 14, it says, um, God says very specifically in the law uh, that they were not to intermarry. And so he laments, for we have forsaken your commandments. So the first step of a godly reaction to sin is to recognize it from scripture, which reveals to us what sin is. But how do we know what is right and wrong today in our changing culture? Well, we can look to scripture to give us some general rules. We know, for example, that marriage is for life. So if you're a married man here this morning, you see a really beautiful woman across the room, and you're thinking, hmm, I wonder whether God is calling me to leave my wife and go off with that other woman. The answer is, no, he is not. (laughs) Because we're told in this book, do not commit adultery. As always, God commands what is moral because he is looking out for our welfare. Some should say we should just follow our consciences. But when our sense of right and wrong has been formed more by the culture than by scripture, we are naturally going to judge some things as normal, which the Bible would call sin. Traditionally, the Bible has been read to say that sex is to be enjoyed within a faithful marriage between a man and a woman. But now our culture would say and laugh at that, calling it repressed. Do we obey what we believe scripture says, or do we follow the crowd? When the people reported that the holy race had been polluted by these mixed marriages, their concern wasn't racial corruption, but rather moral corruption. The people haven't only intermarried with pagans, but they also have taken up their detestable practices. Everything from sacrificing their children in the fire to all kinds of sexual er er immorality connected with the worship of the pagan gods. And God knows, doesn't he, the tendency of our fallen hearts. He knows that rather than influencing their spouses to abandon their idols, and follow the one true God, the Israelites would be tempted to mingle pagan idolatry with their worship of God. And this is called syncretism. And it's always been a major problem for God's people, blending in with the world rather than being distinct from it has plagued Christians down the centuries. We seem to veer from one extreme to the other. We either fit in with the world so well that they were barely unrecognizable from the world, or we head for the monasteries and withdraw from the world. The problem with that is that Jesus wants us to be salt and light, and he wants us to go into the world with a distinct mission to reach the world with the gospel. Chameleons are well known for their distinct range of colors as they're able to shift in different hues and brightnesses and they change their color to match their backgrounds as you can see from these slides i heard about a chameleon who against a red background turned red and when put against a green background turned green but when he was put against a tartan background he exploded Christians aren't called to fit in with their backgrounds, but we are called to be distinctive, to retain our Christian identity wherever we are and whatever our circumstances. And being distinctive doesn't mean being 
odd. <laughs> we don't have to start wearing really weird clothing and speaking in some odd religious language. A friendship with God through Jesus should help us to become more fully human. In this sense, the more like Jesus we become, the more normal we become. When the 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard became a Christian, he declared, now with God's help, I will become myself. The second S represents the word sad, so the godly reaction to sin is to mourn over it. I found it really interesting that the Jewish leaders didn't come to Ezra complaining that the people were greedy or selfish or um, dishonest. The sin that they and God are most concerned about above moral corruption is the state of their hearts. In the original command, God explained the reason for his prohibition. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. The issue is that by marrying people who worshipped other gods, that they would too land up worshipping the same gods. We all have passion for different things, don't we? Some cycling, some sewing, some dancing, some football. And all these things are well and good until they become an idol in our lives. It's so easy to be distracted from our real purpose, which is to love God and enjoy him forever. Mike Iaconelli writes this in his book, The Wittenberg Door. I live in a small rural community. There are lots of cattle ranches around here, and every once in a while a cow wanders off and gets lost. Ask a rancher how a cow gets lost, and the chances are he will reply, well, the cow starts nibbling, and when it finishes, it looks ahead to the next tuft of green grass and starts nibbling on that one. Then it nibbles a tuft of green grass right next to a hole in the fence. And then it sees another tuft of green grass on the other side of the fence, so it nibbles on that one. And the next thing you know, the cow has nibbled itself into being lost. And we are so prone to the same nib and we are so prone to the same, nibbling ourselves all the way to lostness. We keep moving from one tuft of activity to another, never noticing how far we have gone from home or how far away from the truth we have managed to end up. The first command is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And anything that takes us away from that will cause God grief. He loves you. He really loves each one of you. And he loves me so much that he wants nothing in our lives that will distract us from his love. He loves us so much that he sent his only beloved son Jesus to die for us so that we could be in a relationship with God and have our sins forgiven. God is a jealous God and he doesn't want any rivals for his affection. And that's what made Ezra sad, and that's what makes God sad. The wrath of God is provoked not because he's a killjoy and wants to spoil our fun, but he knows that sin leads to bondage and ruin, and he wants only the best for us. Verse 3 said that when Ezra hears the news about the people intermarrying, he tears his cloak and his shirt, he pulls hair from his head and his beard, and he sits down utterly shocked. Ezra is convicted of sin, identifying himself with the sinners, even though he hadn't sinned in this regard. This reaction to sin, sin some commentators say, oh, it's just a cultural thing. Um, and it may well be, but although I have rarely come across it, I have seen this reaction to sin. And I share this story with my friend's permission Recently, a lady in my alpha group um, asked to speak to me after we had met uh, for the evening, and she'd recently become a Christian, and she suddenly had this realization, this conviction of sin. She realized just how dead in her sin she was, and she wept as she realized how badly she had behaved, and she was ashamed of her past life. She said to me that if I knew the sort of person I was, that she was, I wouldn't even be speaking to her. She felt unworthy to come before God. 
I reassured her that that was exactly why Jesus had died, so that her sins could be forgiven. And I prayed with her. And the following week, I asked her how she was. And she said that never in her life had she felt so happy, so free, and so light. Do we understand how much we have been forgiven? The greater the revelation of our sin, the more we will love Jesus. J.C. Ryle said this, Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. Maybe you've never really seen yourself as much as a sinner. You think you're pretty okay, really. And I believe it takes a Holy Spirit to bring a revelation of just how black our hearts actually are and what evil we are all capable of and how much we need forgiveness. In John 16, verse 8, Jesus says, When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict this world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Do we need the Holy Spirit to give us that revelation for ourselves so that we're really able to understand the depth and magnitude and the generosity of his forgiveness. Many years ago, a correspondent of the London Times was reporting on many of, on many of the same problems and issues that we face today. And he ended every article with the question, what's wrong with the world? J.K. Chesterton wrote a brief reply. Dear editor, what's wrong with the world? I am. Faithfully yours, G.K. Chesterton. The third S is for sugar coating. The godly reaction to sin is to agree with God concerning his view of sin. I think we see so much in the media that deadens our hearts to the effects of sin. What at first shocked us, what at, uh, if you think of Mary Whitehouse and what she complained about, to what we now see on our TVs every night, is very different. Because we're so desensitized towards sin, we fail to have the proper response to it, whether it's our own sin or sin in somebody else. We minimize it, we justify it, we ignore it. And I know that I'm really bad <laughs> at facing the fact that I sin. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's an element of healing when we confess our sins honestly to God and maybe another person when it's appropriate and not necessarily a priest. Many years ago, I was expecting our fourth child, and Gareth and I went very excitedly along to the scan. And the nurse asked us whether we wanted to know the gender of the baby, and we said, oh, yes. Having already had three boys, we were very excited when she announced that it was a girl. She then disappeared out of the room for a while and told us to wander around the car park because she just wanted to double-check what she'd seen. And uh, we eventually came back, and uh, she scanned me again, and she said, it's a boy. <laughs> I'll be honest, I was heartbroken. I'd always desperately wanted a daughter, and it felt like it had just been snatched away. And I was really angry with God, and I was grieving the loss of the daughter I'd always wanted. And I spent about six weeks not talking to God. And then one evening, a friend said, would I go along to her with a ch uh, to a church in Croydon? So I reluctantly agreed and thought, I'll sit at the back and read a book or something. Uh, I was not in a good place. And uh, the speaker got up and started speaking. And then he had a word of knowledge and said, there's somebody here who's really angry with God. And her, your heart is ice cold towards him. And that described me. And he said, but he wants to meet with you tonight. And I knew I had to make my peace with him and with the baby because I was in such a bad place. I was prayed for and I experienced the power of God. And in that moment, God met with me. And then the leader of the church came up to me at the end of the service and asked whether I was okay, and I explained the situation. 
And he said, I know this sounds odd, but it can be really helpful sometimes when you confess your sins out loud in the presence of somebody else. And it can be really powerful to confess that to your baby. I must admit, I felt a bit of a plonker. I'd never done that before. And I knew I had behaved appallingly. And so I confessed my sin out loud, saying sorry to God for behaving like a spoilt child and thanking him for the precious gift of this child. And I said sorry to my baby for not accepting him. And as I prayed, I had a wonderful picture of me and my child and Jesus in the garden, just kind of enjoying each other's company. A wave of gratitude swept over me, and I welcomed him for the first time. And I felt such joy and release and peace. Having had the perfect pregnancy up to that point, I was surprised when the following day I started to bleed. And to our sorrow, we lost little Isaac. It was tough, but I was so grateful to God for his incredible grace and timing. Had I not confessed my sin and asked forgiveness from God and from Isaac, I think I would have found it much more difficult to have grieved and recovered from the loss. Confession can bring such healing to our hearts and spirits, and sometimes it's really helpful and appropriate just to be honest and confess our sins to God, but sometimes to another person. I'd like to add this story has a happy ending. <laughs> Several years later, our lovely son Ethan was added to our family, and I could not have been more thrilled or grateful. And in the process, God healed my heart. Ezra confesses before others his sin to God. He doesn't try and make excuses. Ezra calls sin, sin, and he admits his shame because our, his, our iniquities have risen over our heads. And then he goes on to list their sins. And he also doesn't gloss over the effect of sin on people. So, Satan always sugarcoats sin to make it look appealing. And we mistakenly think that sin will get us what we want, but it always leads to bondage and ruin. God's word plainly warns that sin not only enslaves us and eventually destroys us. Ezra prayer reveals where the nation's sins had led them. In, Ezra, in verse 7, on account of our iniquities, we have been given into the hands of the kings to captivity, to plunder and open shame. And he acknowledges that if they don't repent, God may destroy them so that no remnant remains. And the last S is for salvation. Confession throws a person onto God's undeserved grace and mercy based on the sacrifice of Jesus. Ezra doesn't then ask for a favor. He actually admits they've been punished far less than they deserve. Again, God's grace. And God's allowed some of them to remain as a remnant. He recognizes that none of them can stand in God's presence. And there is nothing they can do for themselves. They are fully dependent like we are on God's mercy. Ezra made, made his prayer at the time of the evening offering and maybe it reminded him that God had made a way for sinners to receive forgiveness through the shedding of the blood of a sacrifice. And the Old Testament points the way to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice so that we too can receive forgiveness today. In conclusion, Stephen J. Cole, not our Steve, summarizes it well. Our first reaction to sin must be to see it clearly from the scriptures and not from our culture. Then realizing that to put Jesus on the cross, we should mourn over it. Finally, we should confess it without excuse to the God of mercy, asking him to forgive us so that we can draw close to him again and serve him. I think that Neil's choosing of this sermon series was inspired. I'm sure that we can also identify with the book of Ezra. We've been disconnected with one another and with God because of COVID, 
but now we're being called and gathered back together. We can't pretend that our numbers are back to what they were before the pandemic. We're a remnant, a refugia, as Steve called us last week, where life has an opportunity to re-emerge and consolidate, to reimagine what God can do through us. I began this sermon looking at Ezra's hopes for revival. And many of us, like Ezra, have prayed for and are longing for revival. Wouldn't it be great to start this new season with a clean slate, a cleansed heart, with hearts fully devoted to God? Because if we want revival, it has to start with me and it has to start with you. Psalm 139 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Are you ready to be honest about the state of your heart? Are you ready to ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin? Do we need to confess our sins to God or to one another without excuse? And do we need to come back to God, putting him first in our lives? The following chapter, chapter 10, goes on to say that the people repented and turned back to God. God wants us to know his forgiveness, to know his presence, and he wants our hearts to be fully his. So it's about a love affair, a marriage proposal. We're the bride and he is the bridegroom. God wants nothing to get, into our, get into, to get in the way of our relationship with him. So that's why he minds so much about sin. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for Jesus who makes a way for us that there is no sin no s too small or too large for him to forgive. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring your conviction, not, not some guilt, not some bad feeling, but your conviction that, 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 um, of just things that we've done in the past or the present that displease you. Father, we want to be a people who, whose affection is fixed on you, whose priority is you. And Lord, we want to begin this new term just coming back to you and saying sorry. Lord, we want to follow you with hearts fully wholehearted. We want it to be a love affair. We want to know you as our Lord and our Saviour. And so we pray, God, that you just do a work in us, your people, that we would start this new term as Neil comes back, just with a clean slate, ready to um, do the next season of our journey with you. Lord, give us open hearts. Give us a desire to put you first in our lives. Come Holy Spirit. And Lord, I, I pray too, if there's anyone here that um, maybe something happened a long time ago and they've never told another living soul would you give them the courage to open up to somebody else and allow them to confess their sin? And Lord, would you bring healing and restoration to that person? In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>